And we are live. Welcome, everyone, to today's reading of The Blank Slate. I'm joined by my co-host, Alex Maselli. And we are reading chapters 14 and 15 of The Blank Slate. Now, uh, in chapter 14, Pinker outlines... Let me flip back to it here. Uh, some of the roots of conflict, some of the biological roots of conflict. Not that all conflict is biologically rooted, of course, but he, you know, he, a lot of it is. <clears throat> and he points out how this conflict, it, it, that conflict is not normally cultural. Rather, culture, the, the impression I get from him is that things like culture and religion and science and so on, these are all superstructures that are built to circumvent the conflict that arises uh, from human nature, from our biology. And he, he goes on to show how human nature consistently foils every attempt to put it in line, which I, which I rather like because he's offering a scientific or, 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 well, at least a somewhat scientific backing to this. Uh, this is a social science, so of course take with a grain of salt. But it seems to confirm basically all the stuff that we've known for centuries and that was common sense until about 100 years ago, or even less than that, uh, such as that uh, people sympathize more with their children than they do with other people. And that is just such a no-brainer. Uh, there's a reactionary thinker named Julius Evola who, who is fond of saying that his outlook is just what every sane, well-born person would have thought prior to the revolution. And I would like to say something similar about myself. Not that I'm totally pre-revolutionary. Obviously, I like vaccines and stuff like that uh, and, and modern medicine and so on. But in as much as a lot of the things that are that were once common sense that are now taboo are things that I still think are common sense. And one of them is this bit about how people tend to prefer their children over the rest of the world. That is just such a complete no-brainer that I don't really see how... Oh, hi, Publius. Nice to see you again. Just looked at the chat. Um, that I don't really see how anyone could not see it unless they were deliberately trying not to see it. Uh, and uh, Alex, do you have any any opening salvo about this chapter? Well, I mean, a lot of the the idea that <clears throat> people protect and favor someone with their own genes, that's just, as you said, common sense. Like, it doesn't, and the closer you are to the situation that this would promote your genes further, uh, the more you want to give to them. That includes your spouse, though, your uh, mate, because um, they're an investment in your genes. So to me, I'm sort of like, yeah, this seems really obvious and also not a bad thing. Like, there's this idea that, oh, that, that means it's bad. And I don't think that's accurate. It's like, no, it is what it is. And shouldn't families look out for each other? Isn't that what, you know, decent people do? <laughs> so to me it seems it's not only that it's obvious it's also a good thing that it happens yes, right right exactly i have my little um i have my little burning coal microphone of death here um but yeah, and, and there is sort of this naively utopian thinking, which is, I, I think, extremely artificial and very much a product of the Enlightenment. But also, it, it, besides just being artificial and Enlightenment-based, and I know I blame everything I don't like on the Enlightenment. Everybody has their intellectual vice. That's mine. You know, some people have to compare everything to economics. Some people have to try and model everything with software. My big thing is I blame everything bad that has ever gone wrong on the Enlightenment, including things that probably happened before the Enlightenment. You know, uh, the Library of Alexandria burned down. It was a fucking Enlightenment, even though that was like a thousand years prior. Anyway, um, but I think it is sort of enlightenment based because, and I'm going to go back into it and do another one of my little rants on modernity that I'm sure you all just want to hear yet another one of these. Hear me go over this again. 
back during the Enlightenment, we, we got a hold of this idea we call instrumental rationality, and you can see some antecedents of this cropping up during the Renaissance, because during the Renaissance there was this idea that you could have manuals for everything, and that was very popular during the Renaissance. There were manuals on how to play chess, and there were manuals on sword fighting, and manuals on boxing, and manuals on how to build houses. They loved manuals. The idea that you could have a step-by-step -step process that you could accomplish things by following was just so cool. And so they wrote manuals for everything, and this culminated in the Enlightenment, and then you have Descartes doing things like writing the discourse on method. You have all these philosophers and scientists laying out not just manuals for doing things, but manuals for manuals, so to speak, trying to lay out meta-methods that could be used to uh, accomplish you know, and systematize other things. Like, here's a system that lets you systematize things. Just apply this system, and then you'll get be able to systematize something and then use that system to do whatever you want. And that's where we get natural science. Now, for a long time, that was really successful, and everybody was like, yeah, natural science, really cool. It makes atom bombs and stuff. And we thought that it would be progress, and everything would eventually be perfect, and we'd have a scientifically perfected society. And as it turns out, that didn't work, because World Wars One and Two happened, and now we have horrifying surveillance states it's based on technology in places like China, and it's kind of getting that way here, and it's a little creepy, so technology isn't all good. And um, the other big thing we found out was that natural science doesn't actually fix all your problems, because when you try to apply it to human beings, it kind of fails really hard. I mean, what Steven Pinker is doing here is cool, but it's still mostly just common sense. There is, as of yet, no rigorous social science, if you ask me, and I'm not sure that there really can be. Now. All that being said, um, and if everybody could click the like button, that would be great. One big assumption we've been making for the past 400 years or so is that everything is logically independent of everything else until otherwise noted. The idea is, is that everything should be a perfectly rational thing in isolation that can be examined, and the whole is not greater than the sum of its parts, so once you put everything together and understand all the parts, you'll understand the whole. Um, it, it's, it's a peculiar myriological assumption, myriology being the branch of philosophy that studies part-whole relations, that has come down to us from the Enlightenment. Now, I said all that to say this in response to um, Alex's comment, if anybody even managed to follow that rambling-ass line of thought. I said all that to say this. This idea that it's bad to care more for your relatives than you do for other people it sounds ass backward than it is, but it's the product of several centuries of thinking a certain way. And the certain way that we've been thinking that leads to this is the idea that Every, basically, it is egalitarianism, equality, which actually falls out of instrumental rationality. Because um, the Enlightenment rationality wants to see everything as atomized, independent pieces that are all numerically equivalent, that naturally kind of leads to equality. I know that sounds kind of weird, but l l hear me out. In order to systematize something as you in the same manner that you do the physical sciences, you have to break it down into identical units that can then be quantified and counted. Here's a problem. You can't do that with people because they're too different from each other. But we would like to. So what equality is and has been for centuries is basically an unconscious, note that word unconscious, nobody's doing this on purpose, there's no conspiracy or whatever, this is just kind of happening on its own. It's sort of an unconscious attempt by instrumental rationality to rationalize human beings. Because maybe if we say people are equal enough, they'll actually become equal, and then we can have a scientifically ordered society. Not going to work. But, th but once you take this scientifically ordered society, and once you have it, um, th so the thinking goes, well, people wouldn't do nasty things like preferring their offspring over other people or caring for their families before other people. And you'd just call everyone comrade, and we'd all walk arm in arm into some Whitman-esque glorious sunrise singing the Internationale. Um, and if that sounds completely fucking ridiculous, it is. But understand it didn't just come out of thin air. It took 400 years for things to get that stupid. And they got that stupid for actually a not stupid reason, because people saw how cool natural science was and went, oh, oh let's do that with everything. But you can't do that with everything. Um, I, yeah. I think that um, egalitarianism is uh, 
mostly a good thing until you're willing to sacrifice the individual on its altar. And I think that's when where you go wrong, where you're you're so egalitarian that you don't care whether or not individuals have happiness or choice in their day to day lives. And um, the whole thing about own oh, pe- make people stop caring about their own children that is terrifying. Um, from a like, I mean, we see he talks about examples in the book in the in these chapters about you know trying to put ch- children in like group uh, raising structures uh, away from their parents. And the reason why I find it terrifying is because I think of things like. Um, the monkey the, that was raised without an actual parent and how bad she was um, from a social standpoint as, uh, uh, I think she was actually a primate, as a primate. Because it's like, you can't, you can't take the parenthood out of raising a social creature. That, that's just a disaster waiting to happen. And so, and the any kind of egalitarianism that wants to make children part of the the community's property, like I'm anti in loco parentis, I say that all the time. Um, anytime you do that, um, no matter wh- what their goals are in doing that, like what, what direction they want to go ideology wise, I just I feel like it's a disaster. You're creating people who essentially will not be able to function. Almost every time. Right. And what you're what you're putting your finger on here, I think, is a very important point, Alex, which is that this stuff never works. Every time you try to make this happen, it doesn't work. And what Pinker is doing here that is so valuable, I think, is he's going, look, if you want to be scientific about it and take and be as scientific as you can be about something like this, there is absolutely no evidence that any of this will work and a lot of evidence that it won't, both historical and if you look at biology, it seems pretty clear that people are hardwired a certain way. And if you try to change that, you're going to end up in a world of hurt. You know, we already tried to change it with eugenics and we all saw how that ended up. Um, you know, we, we, I hear a lot from these mandarins in, in these Silicon Valley tech nerds, like, oh, let's genetically engineer people and change people so that they, to, you know, to benefit, so that society will be well ordered. And, you know, we tried that once. It was called the Holocaust. I mean, eugenic, every time eugenics is tried, it, it results in horrific inhumanities, like with the sterilization of Native Americans. The, that was forced. I mean, uh, Sweden's done things like this in the past. Like, you cannot promote this good of the of the whole of humanity idea uh, without hurting people. You just can't. And uh, so you have to understand that for the good, you have to take a hands-off approach, essentially. You know, you cannot force people down a certain avenue because you're just, you're driving headlong into genocide, essentially. And you really can't, we, I mean, we have too many examples in history for us to go, yeah, maybe it'll work this time. It's like, did you get hit in the, on the head after you read about the Holocaust that you think this is a good idea? Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there are plenty of historical examples, but as we've seen, um, intellectuals, Analytical people in general have this problem where they get they they have big brains and they tend to fall into them. And what that means is that when you use logical analysis in a way that is decontextualizing, you go down this bunny trail. It's easy to get lost down an analytical rabbit hole in pursuit of some idea and miss the context, and then go, oh well, no. You see, I've done lots and lots of analysis, and my version of communism works. Or I've done lots of analysis, and my version of scientifically ordering a society is going to work. And and no, no, no. Look, look. Here's I've got all the I've got all these charts. I have all these graphs. They had the charts and graphs the last time too, dude. They they all had charts and graphs too. It didn't work then. I'm not impressed by the charts anymore. Um, and <laughs> but but you can't shake them out of it because they they smart nerds. And I say this as one of these people that is guilty of this. I do this. I know that 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 like analytically minded nerds are this way because I am one. Okay, 
I do this myself. I include myself in this. But smart nerds, especially when they're the kind of people who are involved in IT or uh, or any kind of analytical forecasting work, anything like that, or engineering, STEM, all that stuff, smart people in those fields tend to be absolute shit at acknowledging context and understanding how context is relevant. And if you try to show them why, they'll be like, well, that doesn't make any sense. That's a non sequitur. How is that relevant to what I said? Well, you can't explain to them how it's relevant because they can't see relevance. They they cannot see any relevance besides a proximal logical connection. Um, and if you... And the problem is, is that when it comes to ordering a society, there's a great deal of blurrier systems that have to be dealt with. That's why the most successful countries in the world are those run by lawyers rather than engineers. A country run by engineers is China, which is a totalitarian nightmare. Um... And you might say, oh, well, I talked to a Chinese person who was happy. Go talk to a Uyghur. See how happy they are. Go talk to some Falun Gong person who had their organs harvested because that's more efficient because a fucking country's run by engineers. See what I mean? This is why it has been part of the liberal tradition for centuries now to have your country be run by humanities people rather than STEM people. Because humanities people are better at running countries. Um... And that's a fact that we see playing out in the modern day. <sighs> I would say that, I would say that. because biz- the world of business, especially uh, academic business, re- uh, relies so heavily on data now. Like, there's marketing science and all that stuff, and it, it, there's so much analytics behind what decisions they make. Even if you get someone who's like, I'm a business person, especially one that came out in the last 40 years, you know, into the world and they get in charge. It's almost the exact same results as a STEM person because they're relying on STEM data to make their decisions. And that's what they've been taught to do. So um, you see almost the exact same thing. An older business person or someone who probably wasn't academic is not going to have that same kind of attitude, probably. Right. And that's another thing is that <clears throat> when you're insisting that everything has to be based, and don't get me wrong, that has a place. Obviously, I'm glad that governments use statistics and analytics and technology and so on. But the problem is, is when you insist that everything has to be quantifiable in that way, there's this really nasty problem where whenever things don't fit your model, you are a priori going to dismiss them as statistical noise or as bad signal. If you run into something that doesn't fit your model, you're going to go, oh, well, that's not right. It says this will happen. That's that is clearly the data must be wrong when really your model is wrong. And that's sort of the weakness of um, analysis as a mode of decision making or of quantitative analysis. Anyway, that's sort of the weakness of quantitative analysis as a mode of decision making is that. It can never be. In order to be self-critical, it needs input from an intuitive or a more right-brained approach. Uh, All of the big advances in physics come after thinking things through philosophically. We haven't had any really fundamental advances since the early 20th century, and physicists might get mad at you for saying that. Well, what I do is very important. Well, I'm sure it is, but the fact of the matter is, is since, um, since early 20th century physics, we've been playing out that legacy. We haven't had another revolution. Now, that could be because we don't need one because the theories are finally correct, which eh, never say die. Um, But it could also be because of the fact that we've become so specialized that nobody can, well, the kind of thinking that would enable people to reimagine fundamental things isn't there anymore. Kind of makes you wonder. I kind of do think that um, having gone through the academic rigmarole, that things are too specialized. People don't even have conversations with people in different departments. There's no, there's no interaction. There's, there's no collaboration. Like, oh, you might talk to someone else in your department, but that doesn't mean anything when you're both trained in the exact same ways how to think versus um, I would literally try to hang out with 
say, the finance crowd to see, like, what's going on? Like, and I'm a creative writer because it was, to me, it was always the idea that if I wanted to know more, I had to go out and find people to talk to. And I don't, they don't push that attitude in academics at all. And I think that's an incredible failing of the essentially industrialized academics we have now. Right. Um, one second. And, and honestly, a lot of the supposedly data-driven decisions that are made are really just, um, data-driven is a bad word for it. Data-rationalized might be a better word. Uh, there are some things that it's very hard to get data on, and model building as an approach has the weakness that the mod all models are wrong, and as soon as you try to build something into the model to take account of the gap between model and reality, well, your measurement of the gap is not part of the reality, it's part of the model. And it's also wrong. And you can always revise and be self-critical, which is the real strength of natural science, that it is fundamentally and radically self-critical. It can always... There's no scientific theory that can't be put in jeopardy. Now, some are really well established. Good luck arguing with against relativity, and there's a stereotype of philosophy undergrads as coming up with some harebrained thought experiment that they think is going to... Um, that, that they think is going to unseat general relativity or special relativity or whatever, and of course it doesn't. But the point is, is that in principle, there's no dogma in science. You can question anything. And that's really, that, that's really what the strength of it is. Not all the fancy numbers, and not even the rigor per se, but the willingness to be wrong about anything, although of course not everything at once. I think it's um, quite horrible, and we saw it in this book, how often the humanity in science gets in the way of the actual science. That they, which is kind of funny because that's part of the problem, but they, the way that they'll essentially mob a person for, a, a scientist for having a wrong think idea. And that's been not, that's not a new thing. And, uh, and then there's this fancy term that likes to go around, especially for the layman, scientific consensus. And it really, to me, is like, every time I hear, I hear it, I'm like, is it really scientific consensus? Or are, did they shut up everybody who disagreed and push them out? Because, I, you know, you follow the science world enough, you can see that they're human beings just like anybody else. And they fall prey to ide ideology as well. Yes, but since the Enlightenment, Miss Ella, we've made them into priests. <laughs> we have. We've made... And it, it, I'm almost reminded of... <clears throat> what's that goofy sci-fi thing? Warhammer 40k, I think? Where they have, like, tech priests? Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> but, but speaking of what you were saying... uh. <clears throat> Some radical scientists imagine that the only alternative is an Ayn Randian individualism in which every man is an island. Stephen Rose and the sociologist Hillary Rose, for instance, call evolutionary psychology a right-wing libertarian attack on collectivity. But seriously? Right-wing libertarian? First of all, what the hell is a right-wing libertarian? I think these people are so far to the left that they see any anybody who's not far left just looks like a Nazi. Like, you can be a classical liberal who is all for the legalization of same-sex marriage and smoking marijuana and everything else. Or you can be a conservative Christian. Or you can be, oh, I, I don't know, a moderate business Democrat. And all three of those things just look like straight up fascists to most intellectuals. And there are even people on the left who admit this. Uh, ContraPoints, the uh it is a philosophy vlogger who is is thought of as this maverick on the left because ContraPoints, holy shit guys, talks to conservatives sometimes. 
And and ContraPoints has made this observation that you know the ContraPoints said when I was in academia, we only ever talked to other people on the left. Never once did we even talk to a libertarian, much less a conservative. And it, it really puts me in mind of isolated ecosystems while we're on this topic of biology. Um, in an isolated ecosystem, one thing that frequently happens is you get weird organisms. If you look at a cave where the organisms have been isolated for millions of years, you see these blind fish with white eyes and these weird cave crickets with and whip scorpions, the little grabby pedipalps. And, uh, and, and it also happens on islands, like the giant Weta is the world's largest insect. It's freakishly large, and it only lives on certain islands because organisms that live on islands have this weird thing where they'll uh, they'll uh, get really strange traits from getting isolated. And this is... I'm almost tempted to ascribe this a metaphysical significance because it cuts across domains. Not only does it occur in biology, but also in culture. Uh, why is Japanese culture so fucking weird? Well, they were isolated for centuries. I isolation creates weirdness. Isolation creates eccentricity. Um, anything that is cut off and is allowed to change in isolation long enough gets weird. Um, that, that's why creativity requires solitude, because you have to be cut off from everybody else long enough for things to actually become different inside of you so you can make a new thing. But anyway, the reason I say all that was to say this. I think that because academia is, so to speak, an isolated ecosystem, it has some of the same properties as an isolated ecosystem. And one of those is that the organisms that live there start to get really strange after a while and look almost unrecognizable uh, to the rest of the world. And then they act like everybody else is the problem when they meet someone outside of the ecosystem. And and it's to me it's so silly, especially if they they are in the humanities, like if they're in art or writing or whatever, and then they act like everybody else is the freak. And it's like, nah, I think you're just they don't know anything about the world either. And but they act worldly because they went to college. And it's like that's not um actually you just know about college. And I, <laughs> which to me is like, oh, it's such a minor thing to know about. I mean, there's a whole big world out there. And just because you went to college, that doesn't make you, like, know everything about the world. Um, there's a lot that goes on that is not part of academia. And uh, they really just don't know how to react to people outside of academia. Um Someone, uh, they react very viscerally, angrily, when anything disrupts or uh, challenges their ideas of the world because of this. And that's freaking awful. Right. Yeah, it, it, you're, you're right. And, it's, and that's because if you spend all your life in one place, you forget that the rest of the world exists. Um, a good example of that, actually, is the Mandarins at Oberlin College. There was this big debacle where a few Oberlin students stole from a bakery, and they did steal. They confessed in, to, to doing this, and they were caught on camera and everything. Bakery calls the cops on the students. Well, the students were black, and the people owning the bakery were white. Can you guess what the administration, not the students, the administration at Oberlin College did? Called them racist? For reporting them? Oh, they stirred up they stirred up a smear campaign. They had they were sending students, not just students going independently, but they were the administration was organizing with some woman from the administration standing around with a bullhorn, organizing students to go protest outside this place, put up, you know, I think they were putting up flyers with pictures of the bakery owners with swastikas superimposed on them. I heard somebody told me that. I can't vouch if it's true, but I heard that. You know, just all this crazy stuff. And the administration at Oberlin really thought they were going to get away with that. Well, they got slammed with a defamation lawsuit and ended up paying something like $33 million. I mean, enough to actually hurt a wealthy institution. I mean, they were screaming. And then you know what they do. They, they say that the jury was obviously ignorant about the subject matter or something like that. They, like, they insulted the intelligence of the jury while they were trying to appeal. And my thought is, are you serious? 
it, it, it reminds me very much of something of a historical event. Um, the Chinese thought that their civilization for a long time was the center of the universe. And they had this idea that the Chinese emperor, technically everyone on Earth was a subject to him. And then, you know, the colonial era comes around, the Europeans roll up in their giant ships with guns on the sides, and the Chinese are expecting them to kowtow to the emperor. And that didn't happen. They weren't taking the Middle Kingdom's emperor very seriously. They didn't think he was their emperor. They kind of, he, he kind of looked like uh, dog meat to them. <laughs> and I apprehend something very similar going on with Oberlin and by extension with academia in general is these people are, are hermetically sealed in this place where they're little god kings. And then when the colonists step onto the island, they're expecting kowtowing and then they get a boot up their ass and can't figure out why and then say, well, obviously somebody involved in this is racist. Okay. Keep doing it. I know. I know. <laughs> wonders if Ober Oberlin is that was yeah. Uh, yes. If their administration wasn't trying uh, to kill bad press, essentially. Oh, students were uh, associated with the university were caught doing something illegal, and like they, you know, tried to head that off the pass with something stupid. Because half the time, I don't think that the people up at the, up at the top are necessarily um, full believers so much as they are using it for methods of, you know, getting around things and doing, like, essentially a, um, a, a facelift campaign. You know, like, oh, we can't have this bad press. Let's make it about how they were racist. Make them the bad guys, and then we look like the good guys. Part of me wonders if that isn't somewhat what they were thinking I'm sorry can you re-say that last part just that I, I wonder if that um, you know a, a, a marketing campaign essentially wasn't behind partially their decision to uh, force them, the bakery to be the bad guys and them to be the good guys Uh, I, I, I certainly don't doubt it. I mean, a lot of this stuff, generally speaking, I think the higher up you go, the more performative it is, is my guess. And the people that do, who are both, the people that believe it tend to be naive ideologues, college students, uh, or people in their 30s who still think they're college students and they still have purple hair and uh, 15 ear piercings. Not that I have anything against people who have an alternative style as long as they're responsible, but, you know, there's a stereotype and stereotypes tend to have a grain of truth to them. Um, but the, the, the sort of the lower echelons of the movement tend to be people who really believe what they're saying. People who actually swallow this crap. And then the further up you go, the more you find grifters. Um, I have seen for well for example Syra Rao is a grifter. Now she's also she might just be completely insane. Um that there is that distinct possibility. Uh but but she's a you know she lives in the wealthiest neighborhood of the city she lives in. Um her husband's a billionaire. White women pay her two thousand dollars to yell at her over yell at them over dinner. This woman has it made, and if she's really that oppressed, she can always make herself feel better by asking her husband for an island for her birthday. Um, so she is definitely in the upper echelons of the movement. Now the question is, does she really believe it? Like, what, what do you think? Do you think Syra Rao really believes what she's saying? I think. I see, think, on a see, corporate on level, a corporate I think level, most, I think of, most those of those people don't people believe, don't but when it comes to these public speak. figures who are pushing it, I think that maybe they don't believe it, but they have to per perform that they believe it so often, and they even have to come out with crap tons of ideological uh, thought processes for other people to follow, that I think eventually they do start to believe it. Um, and but that creates kind of a, a, an insanity because you can't be performing it uh, so uh, authentically without starting to believe it. And you know it's fake 
So as the grifter, so it starts damaging your psyche, essentially. It's sort of that if you wear a pig mask long enough, eventually your face looks like a pig's face. That sort of thing. Yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. And it's true, you know, um, going back to the example I used earlier of the Chinese, uh, the Chinese tributary system during Imperial China had a particular feature where the rulers of the surrounding lands would have to come and bow before the Chinese emperor and give him, I think they had to give a hostage to the Chinese court. Well, hostage, not like kept in a cell, but someone from the royal family of surrounding countries would have to come stay in the Chinese court. Now, there wasn't really, there weren't, wasn't really any significant tribute levied. It was mostly symbolic submission, but the point was to make them do this for centuries at a time until they really came to believe that the, that, that, the Middle Kingdom was the Middle Kingdom, that Imperial China really was the center of the universe. And I think wokeism has a similar effect, but it will, I, I'm optimistic that it can't last forever. And this is why. Because, because it does not tolerate any dissent whatsoever, not even a tiny bit, it purity spirals, like you said, it purity spirals very hard. And I think, honestly, if you want to, if you want to curb stomp wokeism, what you need to do is not fight it the way we are, you know, because we're not trying to stop it that way. We're just making a space for like minded people. If you really want to end it sooner rather than later, go ahead and pretend to be woke and just say the most insane shit you can. <laughs> because everyone else will have to follow along or else look like they're not believing it hard enough. And if they if they're not as extreme as you, uh, and you know you can you can do this on the internet and fake an identity if you want. Not that anyone should ever do this. Uh, I, I don't think you should. Um, but but if you make a if you were to make a fake profile with um, and make yourself out to belong to some protected group. And then say the most insane woke shit you could, uh, that would cause the purity spiral to speed up. And the more it speeds up, the more it speeds up. So if you want to push it into overdrive and get them to act as crazy as possible, that's a great way to do it. Woke, th this whole thing would have set itself up, it would have been a lot scarier if it had actually tolerated some small amount of controlled dissent. But it doesn't. They, they're so gun ho especially the, the the foot soldiers, essentially, that they don't, and it, they don't see the context. They don't see the, they can't predict how uh, extreme they are and are going to be. And because they've, they've managed to isolate themselves, and they love isolating themselves, they uh, cannot see how many people disagree with them already. They cannot see that they're not actually, when it comes to pure numbers, a majority. Because they, ha they control so many spaces, so they have no idea what is coming. And it's like, you can't sustain this. You've made it impossible to sustain this. Um, I mean, that's why 2016 happened the way it did. And that's why the next one is going to, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but speaking of what's coming, I'm interested in finding a way to benefit from this. Now, I think that one of the things that will ultimately kill wokeism, and I, I don't think this is wishful thinking, this isn't wishful thinking or a slogan, it's a truism, get woke, go broke. But the opposite also of that is be unwoke mucho dinero. Because right now, people are so tired of woke entertainment, which is just bland, uh, flavorless agitprop that doesn't entertain or edify or gratify. People are so tired of woke entertainment that if you give them access to something that's not woke, they will eat it up. And pretty soon, companies, publishing companies, media companies, all that, are going to realize this. So... If I can publish a book, or you know, if any creative can 
uh, put something out that is unwoke entertainment and do it at the right time when everybody is starving for it, uh, you're going to be filthy rich. Um, if you do it at the right time, the question is timing it right. And my way of timing it right is just to constantly do it um, and constantly be releasing these things so when the wave does start to rise, I'm already on top of it. And that's the idea. Just keep making unwoke entertainment. And uh, as people find it, and that wave starts rising, and people become more and more ravenous for entertainment that is not woke, uh, the more money I'm going to make. <laughs> you know, I, I write these little uh, very unwoke uh, books under a pen name that I publish on Kindle Direct. I, you know, I have this channel, although this is less entertainment and more podcasty, but still. You know, I, I'm still I'm still riding that wave. Well, and, it, and I know a lot of people feel like giving up. They think um, that they've won, you know, and that there's no place in the world for people like us anymore, uh, especially artists like us. And it's not true. I keep I I try to show them that, like, even on Twitter, where they like essentially the idea is that the woke controls Twitter. Even there, they can get. Uh, hardcore slammed for being so wrong. Like the recent Keep, Keep Kink and Pride article, which um, uh, hilariously did not go over well. <laughs> and um, which also actually related to um, chapter 15 of this because it was a, it, chapter 15 was about our moral re, uh, rejections of certain things where do they come from and that it, like pedophilia might be one of them and uh like i don't i don't think they have one uh it seems like they control a lot of really big spaces but they haven't won and there is a, going to be a place and there is currently a place for artists like this um you just have to find it and um make connections so i mean that's really important It's, you know, <clears throat> it, 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 it's, it, it reminds me of a New York Times article that I read part of. I can never stomach an entire NYT article, and I always use archive.is links um, in order to deprive them of any ad revenue they may get. And starving the New York Times is a, is a good thing to do, and everyone should try to deprive them of money as much as full. So here's a web archive I'm going to put in the chat of this article called Joe Rogan is too big to cancel. He's now one of the most consumed media products on the planet. His Spotify deal, estimated at 100 million, speaks to the allure of making audiences feel they're in on something subversive. Because ultimately, it's not about being woke. Maybe that's in right now, but ultimately, uh, our society is still run by one thing and one thing only. And if you can get that for a company, they don't care if you're woke or not. If they think it will make them money, they will put it out there. All that needs to happen is for the first one to pop, for the first uh, pop cultural not woke thing that is not nonfiction, you know, the first non woke art essentially to pop to make a lot of money, and then the floodgates are going to open. We've already seen <clears throat> sort of a foreshock of that in. Uh, sort of a foreshock of that in the whole manga thing. You, you were aware of this. I think we discussed this, didn't we? Yes, we have. That, that people read manga, Japanese comics, because they're not woke. Um, and I actually have a friend who lives in Japan. Uh, I won't say his name to protect his... I'll say his first name. His first name is Lensei. Um, he he's part of a uh, he, he's a musician and you know he's very into pop culture and art and all these things. Very smart guy, um, um, brilliant actually. But he has related to me that this set of problems that the woke are so preoccupied with are known in Japan. The Japanese know about this stuff. They read they you know their media reports that they're all in on it. And he says that 
Japanese people are so befuddled by this. They're like, Westerners are fucking crazy. What is wrong with them? And it's, I, I mean, it's just fascinating to see how societies outside this one look at our problems. Um, and see, and, and to see that what we are told is the cosmopolitan enlightened viewpoint is in fact very parochial. And it's not, you know, these, this scoffing is not coming from some third world backwater. It's coming from a very advanced, very wealthy non-Western society. Um, so this idea that they're somehow not educated enough to understand it doesn't really hold water, which it would be the response if it, the criticism came from anywhere else. You said that, you said that um, uh, companies would companies still publish, would still, publish still support non-woke items if they felt they could, you know, make money off it. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing a major push from the same side to get rid of capitalism. Because they because know the, that capitalism is not supportive of it. Because it is, it's uh, the marketplace of free ideas, the, you know, the marketplace of get woke, go broke. All these things show that it does not, it cannot be supported in a society where anyone can start their own business and sell items. Which is hilarious <laughs> because they're so into making money. <laughs> Right. And I think what they're going for, some kind of oligarchical state, oligarchical state capitalism where, you know, Fang can rule everything and we have monopolies and so forth. Uh, that's not going to make it. I think that our, especially in the United States, our judicial apparatus is robust enough to knock that, to knock that down. Antitrust will happen. It'll be a repeat of the Seven Sisters thing in the 20th century when we, when they busted the oil trusts. Now it's the tech trust, and there are a lot of parallels there. Like, uh, oil was a new technology at the time, um, or rather, combustion engines, which are powered by oil, was were a new technology. Um, the companies were all very recent arrivals that rose meteorically. Um, they were all multinationals. It, it was a lot of eerie parallels with tech, and it ended in a trust bust, which is already underway. A lot of states, this is at the state, not the federal level, are, are issuing trust-based challenges to Google and the like. So this is definitely coming, and without that, the, um, the, the compromise between capitalism and socialism that the woke want, I don't think is going to happen. Um, I don't also, I just don't think that the Democratic Party has the balls to ram it through. I, I just, you know, they, they, the, one of the nice things about the woke is that they can only really be unified for a short period of time by a common enemy. Uh, after that, they all fall to squabbling and stabbing each other in the back. You know, it's this sort of rainbow coalition of people who feel that they are disadvantaged in one way or another but they're all out for their own special interest and they very easily fall to stabbing each other in the back. Whereas people who are not woke and care more about fairness than these really uh, dubious ideas about power and exploitation, ultimately ro rooted in French philosophy, but currently uh, very popular, all the people who are anti-woke sort of cooperate naturally. They don't have a beef with each other and they're, and they're more altruistic than not. Or I wouldn't even say that, not even more altruistic. They're self-interested in the right way. Um, and I think my audience is philosophically literate enough to realize I just paraphrased Plato. It's in the Republic. I would say, uh, and I said it earlier, the idea that um, sacrificing the individual for egalitarianism there's this thing it comes from a manga uh series i read years ago where they talk about a character who is so generous that eventually that character doesn't even have a body they gave away everything and this the point of that story was to say that giving away everything is not good um <laughs> that you can't the whole help yourself before you help others, there, there's this idea that any amount of selfishness is inborn and impossible to overcome from a lot of these people. And that's part of the reason why they completely accept their own selfishness um, and they assume everyone else is going to be selfish. 
And the problem is, is that, no, there's this middle ground where you help yourself and you help others. And it's totally possible. Uh, we see in, in this book, he talks about how there's there's that balance between not wanting to be shoved and not shoving others. Like, it's in your own best interest to not be selfish sometimes. And we see that with companies, too. So to me, I'm, I'm sort of like, you, this extremism, that's all it is, is it's extremism, uh, is distorting how we actually behave as people, how we actually interact, in, even on a business level. Yes. Yes, it is. And, I mean, woke businesses... If the woke is, per they can survive and even thrive provided that the wokeness is performative. As soon as it becomes sincere, it just completely sucks the life out of everything because you, because reality doesn't actually work like that. <laughs> it just doesn't. You've seen so many businesses like, uh, oh, this all female business fell apart because they just didn't get along. That They made that choice because they wanted to be pro woman and it's like that's a stupid reason to hire people <laughs> and then like uh i've seen so many woke charities where the person was just stealing all the money themselves it's like yeah the, you can't you can't work this way it does and you can't accomplish anything really I heard I I had heard about the all the all woman business before a long time ago, but I think that's hilarious. And it's really what I find one thing I find kind of interesting is when you stop if when you stop all that nonsense, all the identity political nonsense, and just hire based on merit, you generally speaking do end up with a fairly uh, diverse team. And the reason for that is a lot of the cognitive elite of many countries comes to the United States for the better opportunities. If you look at the list of different ethnicities and see who earns the most, white people are not the richest demographic. We're up there, but uh, Chinese Americans make more than we do. Taiwanese Americans make more than we do. Uh, Pakistani Americans, Indian Americans, um, Parsi, like uh, Persian people from India. All these ethnic groups in the United States make more money than white people because the ones that come here are from the cognitive elite of those countries, the ones with the highest IQs, and they come so they come here for the better opportunity. And what that means is that if you're trying to hire the best people, you're going to end up with actually a very diverse smorgasbord of the smartest people from all around the world. So it, just hiring based on merit is going to give you some of the diversity you were looking for anyway. Hi, Lynn Newman. Nice to see you here. Uh, I was going to say the Nigerian Americans are on that list too, as earning above white Americans. <laughs> you don't say. And 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 the answer to this, if you bring this up to a wokey, well, first of all, they'll just refuse to perceive it, which is what they normally do when you give them uh, evidence that doesn't confirm the, their worldview. Generally speaking, I find that. Um, Progressives are like this in other spheres of life besides the political as well. If you tell them something they don't want to hear, they'll go, what? Huh? What'd you say? Like, they, they, they seem to have this very selective hearing. And that's, in, it's, that's just a personality trait of progressives. They're like that in all areas of life, not just the political. But in the political sphere, it's very annoying because you can show them this evidence and they'll just not look at it. Like, they'll respond in a way that shows that they just clearly refuse to perceive what was right in front of their eyes. Um, and then if you shove it down their throats to the point where they can't ignore it anymore, they, the response is, well, all those groups of people are actually white. That, 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 that's the response. <laughs> that's literally what they say. They're, it, even if they're not physically white, they're enacting whiteness. Okay. Okay, I gotta get off the bus now.
I, I and that I found is the best strategy because if you argue with them, they'll just dance around and play semantics and redefine terms. Arguing with them is pointless because you're not going to convince them anyway, unless you can you know humiliate them in a, with a public argument, which is great because it makes people who are on the fence not not want to be on their side. Uh, but instead of arguing with them, I, I found very often the best response is to just be dismissive, just be like, you know what, whatever, whatever you're saying, it doesn't matter. I, I got to get off the bus. You've gone to crazy town. Go talk to somebody else about Xenu. Um, and I found this to be very effective because progressives by nature are very agreeable people and they respond very strongly to rejection and ostracism. So if you just make a point of rejecting them very publicly, that has more of an effect on their behavior than any amount of logical argumentation because they don't respond to logic. Yeah, I've said I've, I'm done with this conversation before. The other thing that I apparently like to do, I noticed it a couple of days ago, is sarcastically agree with them. Just because so often they can't understand sarcasm. They just don't, they don't take it in. And then someone else sees that I'm being sarcastic, someone who's not in this, and they go, they, they have a chuckle out of it because it's like, that's how stupid these people are sometimes. Is that they can't even recognize obvious sarcasm. And more to the point, maybe maybe it's not even stupidity so much as the fact that sarcasm is something that's sort of playful, and there's and there's just no capacity to have fun on that side of the aisle, none at all. Which is weird. I mean, I think we discussed this last time that the lower the lower left quadrant of the political compass likes to act all bubbly and cute and rainbows and sparkles, ooh woo. But then when you look closely at how they really are, they're nihilistic, self-loathing little toads. It's really striking. It's really striking. Reminds me kind of a Bush babies. Bush babies are like really cute, but also incredibly dangerous. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. Or I might be getting the name wrong, but there are there are some like incredibly adorable, especially humans find them adorable, uh, animals that are actually dangerous. Like I think a lot of people think the platypus is cute, and it's like uh, don't go near one. <laughs> oh no, that spur on the back foot is um that's a doozy. Exactly. So uh, we're we're getting close to an hour. Um, do you have a closing statement, Alex? I wanted to bring this up because it just made me laugh out loud. Um, he creates a model, which you were talking about how models are failure, uh, often fail, of uh, what would happen if two parents were marooned on an island and all they had, there was the complete isolation in raising their child. And he said uh, there was the conclusion that they wouldn't even have sex for fun. And I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> it made me laugh. I was like, uh, sex is pleasurable because it creates more children. <laughs> right. The, the fact that, yeah, I mean, okay, I, I think basically if you took two heterosexuals of the opposite sex and drop them on an island and just leave them there long enough, eventually that's going to happen. Even if they hate each other. Like, like it, it might take five years, but it's going to happen. It, it just can't. Even if they both find each other physically repulsive, eventually they will. That's just human nature. There, come full circle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, anyway, that's, uh, that's all we have for now. Until